from the studios of Farm Journal Broadcast. This is U.S. Farm Report. Welcome to U.S. Farm Report this weekend. I'm Tyne Morgan, and here's what's in store over the next 60 minutes. The single largest rural electrification investment since Roosevelt. We have details on the White House's new rural energy plan. Just as a grain deal extension was struck, the Kansas Wheat Tour shows just how bad the scars of this year's drought truly are. Grain prices plummet, so is a big commodity reset of 2023 now underway? Are we going back to $3 corn? No. Are we going back to low $4 corn? In our minds, no. And in John's world. A chance to see what happens when there are more BEVs on the road. Now for the news, the Black Sea grain deal has been extended for another two months. The announcement coming just as the initiative was due to run out. The deal between Russia and Ukraine allows Ukraine to ship grain through the Black Sea to parts of the world struggling with hunger. The original accord was brokered last summer by the United Nations and Turkey. Russian officials confirming the extension, but it's not known what concessions Moscow may have received. To see the deal extended is definitely a good thing, keeps that market open. Um, but again, still a lot of unknowns here moving forward. We'll see how long it actually is going to remain in place and, and what they're, if they're going to continue to ship corn and wheat um, and where all those destinations continue to go. So I really don't think the Ukraine corridor deal is that important anymore, but given that the ending stocks are gone from Ukraine, I think it's when Russia's ready to play a different card geopolitically and say, you know, we're going to pull back on this wheat we're going to start to create some problems with wheat prices going up and see if we can pressure geopolitically some of our partners here to kind of see things our way. And I think that might be what they're setting up to do here. This latest extension is in place through July 18th. Also this week, the annual winter wheat crop tour was held in the Central Plains, with scouts seeing firsthand what drought and frost freeze events have done to this year's crop. During three days of scouting, tour participants traveled six routes from Manhattan to Colby to Wichita back to Manhattan, Kansas. The three-day average calculated yield was pegged at 30 bushels an acre. The Wheat Quality Council says while an estimated 8.1 million acres of wheat were planted last fall, drought has robbed the state's yield potential with scouts spotting many abandoned fields. They are projecting total wheat production in the state at 178 million bushels with more than 26 percent of the crop expected to be abandoned. Meanwhile, farmers hoped warmer weather and some timely rains would continue to keep planters rolling as we moved through the past way mark on planting progress. USDA expecting big things out of this year's crop according to that latest supply and demand report. USDA says currently 65% of the corn crop is in the ground. That's up from 49% last week, and it's six percentage points ahead of the five-year average. Missouri is still leading the way, now 96% planted on corn. Checking on soybeans, now nearly half the crop is planted at 49% nationally. That's up 14 points from last week and well ahead of average. Planting is finally underway in North Dakota. Now 2% of the crop there is planted, well off the average pace of 15%. Spring wheat planting still behind. Now 40% of the crop is in the ground. That's up from last week, but still 17 percentage points behind normal. The Biden administration is making what it calls a historic investment in clean energy across rural America. USDA announcing it plans to invest nearly $11 billion in grants and loans. The funding is available through two programs. First is the Empowering Rural America, or new ERA program. It will make almost $10 billion available to rural electric cooperatives for renewable energy, zero emission, and carbon capture. There's also the Powering Affordable Clean Energy program, or PACE. That will have $1 billion available in partially forgivable loans to renewable energy developers and electric service programs providers. It allows more and more communities to harness the potential of clean energy for not only families, but their economic bottom line. Money for the programs comes from the Inflation Reduction Act. USDA says it represents the single largest investment in rural electrification since the signing of the Rural Electrification Act of 1936 during the Roosevelt administration. 
Meanwhile, the administration also announcing a plan that would allow conservationists and others to lease federally owned land. The idea is that the land would be restored. The administration contends it would work much the same as any oil company with buying leases to drill or how ranchers pay to graze cattle. Some Republican lawmakers and others in the ag industry are against the plan. They're concerned it's a backdoor way of excluding mining, energy development and agriculture. But the director of the Bureau of Land Management says the plan would make conservation an equal to grazing and drilling while not interfering with them. While the Bureau previously issued leases for conservation in limited cases, it has never had a dedicated program for it. That's it for the news. Well, more rains this week, so is El Nino to think. We'll check in with meteorologist Matt Engelbrecht next. Your next piece of equipment is on MachineryPete.com. Search equipment from dealerships across the country to find what you're looking for. Only on MachineryPete.com. U.S. Farm Report weather is brought to you by H&S Manufacturing. Available in 16 and 18 wheel models, the HC7116 high capacity rake can handle your high tonnage forage, even corn stalks. Find out more at the H&S website. Time now for a check of weather with meteorologist Matt Engelbrecht. Matt, Noah now saying while an El Nino watch remains in place, the signs of El Nino are growing stronger and El Nino conditions are likely to develop within the next couple of months. There's also a 90% chance that those conditions will persist into winter. So is that what's starting to spur more of those rain events across the plains and even the Midwest? Yeah, Tyne, that's a, a great question. Uh, we expect an El Nino to develop, but uh, when we talk El Nino or La Nina, uh, these are global circulations, so the direct impacts from them uh, are delayed as well. Uh, being very large circulations, they take a long time to establish. So even though we're talking about El Nino now, we really won't feel the effects of it in that global circulation until uh, coming up this winter and next spring. We are still under the influence of uh, kind of La Nina a global circulation this summer. A root zone map, the latest on that, actually got some relief or some help uh, back in the plains. We're seeing the blue uh, where it is now wet, still a little dry uh, back into Missouri and into Iowa as well as into Michigan and back here towards the east. Also very dry back up uh, into the northwest, including Canada, where they continue to deal with those wildfires. Now, the estimated rainfall of the last uh, seven days, you, know, you got, uh, again, a substantial amount of rainfall where that root zone map has showed uh, some uh, wet areas. Uh, also, a lot of rainfall back into Texas as well the last seven days, uh, seven, uh, six to seven days. The pattern ahead going into Memorial Day weekend supports a more light to moderate showers back here to the west, if not a more sporadic showers and then dry conditions. This is May 23rd through the 27th uh, into the, uh, the northeast. And this is going to be typical of a ridge building across the United States. So rain chances will stay uh, pretty low. They won't be zero, as you can see here, pretty low, uh, even between about May 25th and also the 31st of May. Not a lot of shift uh, in where we see the dry or the uh, you know, drier than normal or the wet or wetter than normal. Reason for that is that jet stream isn't moving all that much. A ridge is going to continue to establish itself through two thirds of the United States with the possibility of some rain where we need it back up into the northeast Sunday and into Monday. But I pressed the, uh, the button to play this through. And if you want to get more rain back through the plains or back down here to the south, uh, you want energy to be ejected from the northwest and translate down here to the south. That's just not the case. We get these little pieces of energy that are just weak enough to kind of ride right along uh, the border rather than cut into this ridge. Most of the energy is going up and over. So what this means, uh, this is the pattern established on Wednesday. Good portion of the United States under the ridge of high pressure, which is going to keep things uh, pretty quiet and that severe weather threat, big pattern threat, very low. Thanks, Matt. Well, is it just the weather that's really taken the wind out of the grain markets sales? Well, Arlen Suderman and Tommy Grossafi join us to talk markets next. Welcome back to U.S. Farm Report this weekend. Arlen Suderman and Tommy Grasapi joining us. Well, Dwayne Bussey tweeted this out earlier this week. He said it feels like this was 4th of July weekend and we just got a major rain. I mean, Arlen, you talk about prices sinking and just continuing to sink. What is pressuring the corn market right now? 
Well, so we look at the corn market, we've had a lot of export sales that have been canceled by China. We've had some Chinese buyers in our office here over the past couple of weeks, and they point to the cheaper Brazilian supplies and the need to diversify away from the United States where possible. So they're very actively buying that. And not only that now, because of the rapidly increasing production in Brazil, uh, we're seeing even Mexico, our long dependent customer has been buying 17 million metric tons a year buying a lot of corn out of out of Brazil and our customers are saying they really like that Brazil corn and they're not likely to switch back. So we're losing markets because of the ability of Brazil to expand production at a lower price. Tommy, is the fund action have anything to do, do you think, with this sudden fallout in prices that, that we've had? Absolutely. And the, the funds, I've always told people in my career, is that when the funds are buying, you want to sell it to them. If you're afraid to sell it to them, protect it with them. Buy the put. Now, what happens when the funds buy? The markets go up. And over the last few years, we've seen enormous fund length. Take it back to a few years ago, and Arlen could correct me. A few years ago, they let the funds get doubly long or doubly short. They increased how many futures and options they can have on. When the funds buy it, if you're not selling it and protecting it with them, you get what's happened the last three months. Ever since March options expired, we've done nothing but roll down, roll down. And when a market goes down, all markets, it looks cheap. I'll never forget being a trader during the NASDAQ debacle in the 2000s. Every stock looked cheap. And right now, grains look cheap. But as we've seen in this week's price action, they can get cheaper. And the CME group and all the exchanges around the world, margin calls, you don't have 10 days to mail in and check anymore. We have intraday margin calls. We have end of the day calls. We have ACHs, wires. The money's due, people. You may think the market's cheap. Fine. Send in another check for the spec long. It's hurt terribly. And the very move that funds that got us up are now getting us down. Arlen, as, as Tommy sets the stage with that, you know, are summer weather rallies still possible? And what are some realistic expectations and price targets that, that, that farmers should be thinking about from these price levels? Well, they are possible. In fact, nearly every year, we do see some type of a weather scare sometime in May or June. One big exception is 2013. We saw a little bit of bounce that year, but that's about it. And we've been following 2013 real close. It doesn't mean we're going to continue to do so, um, but that's just kind of a reminder that we don't always get that. And that's why we've been emphasizing for the past several months, we need to focus on protecting equity. We need to be treating this like a business. We spent the last several years being rewarded for doing nothing. And now that's going to cost us if we continue with that mindset. We need to be focusing on the returns and, and the margins. And when we get those opportunities to lock those in uh, and take advantage of that, because it's not just us selling on the Chicago market, it's Brazil as well. And I did a, a meeting with Brazil farmers virtually here a little over a week ago, and they were saying, hey, we are undersold. We've got a lot because we've been bullish. And after my presentation and I explained what's happening in the fundamentals, they were scared to death. And what that means is they're they're going to respond just like American farmer. If you're scared, the next rally comes along, you're selling. So that means not just the U.S. farmer selling next rally, it means the Brazil farmer selling next rally, which means it takes that much bigger of a story to change the dynamics to be able to sustain a, uh, some type of weather rally or something like that. And going into El Nino, that may be difficult to do. Tommy, you're, you're, you'll hear some market analysts say, well, listen, you know, use crop insurance as a tool. That is a tool, but that doesn't cover all of your bushels. Uh, and I've seen a rookie mistake uh, being out on the speaking tour. You see people say, "I during Commodity Classic, I gave a speech, and it's out there publicly. There's a guy in a yellow shirt I get in an argument with. He stands up and he says, the market always goes back to the crop insurance level, and that'd be 591. And I yell at the top of my lungs, always? Always? And we got in a little beef, but what he meant was most of the time. And to Arlen's point with the 2013 numbers and how much this is correlating, I think there's a whole group of people out there who would be so excited if we got back to 591. If we do, great. I'll tell you one thing, how for how affordable options are right now, and there's a reason they're affordable is because volatility's come down. If you think we're going higher, you can do all types of things in the Chicago Board of Trade Options market or other option markets around the world to buy back that upside. Harvest is 120 days away. 
60, 70 days away for the folks down south. Store and Ignore is no longer going to work with 8, 9, 10% interest rates on operating. Thanks, Tommy. Thanks, Arlen. Well, we haven't even got into the grain deal. We haven't even got into the winter wheat tour in Kansas. So we'll do all of that coming up later on U.S. Farm Report. Stay with us. As electrification continues to gain steam with the current administration, what's the cost of owning and even repairing electric vehicles? It's something John Phipps explores this weekend in John's World. I will be talking more about repairing machinery and the right to repair issue later in the show. But related to that is the cost of repair debate regarding BEVs and ICE vehicles. As the tiny number of electric cars trickle out in the U.S. fleet, multiple attempts have been made to compare the cost of ownership and more specifically, the cost of maintenance for these new machines. It's hard to put much stock in these numbers though. The number of BEVs is very small. Uh, these are the earliest technology and a couple of years is too short to approximate a car's lifetime expenses. Luckily, we do have an entire country to act as the test case for this experiment, Norway. Last year, 80% of all cars in, sold in Norway were BEVs. Norway's about the size of California, but with only 5.5 million people, so the government has been working hard to install charging stations to ease the range anxiety. The trickiest problem has been high-density housing, like apartments, where parking is already a premium, let alone parking with a charger. Gas stations like, oddly enough, Circle K, are adding high-speed chargers and lucrative additional dining areas for people waiting. Early reports are some com consumer confusion on how to operate the charging kiosk, not, li not unlike the introduction of self-serve gas pumps or self-checkout at stores. Coffee and snack sales are way up, though. Their power grid shows little sign of strain as most BEV owners charge at night because electricity is a lot cheaper. To my surprise, even heavy construction machinery is beginning to be introduced, mostly for urban areas where regulations are very strict. Even with a relatively small proportion of BEVs in their fleet, there are already some obvious but largely unanticipated outcomes. City residents quickly notice the difference in air quality and most notably noise. EVs will likely have their biggest impact in large cities. There haven't been mass mechanical layoffs either. Whether that continues to be the case is unknown since ice repair demand cannot be compared fairly to new BEVs yet. The biggest change has been for car dealers, as empty showrooms have far fewer ICE vehicles, clearly because they won't be sold after 2025. The switch has upended the car sales ranking, with Tesla, Volkswagen, and now relatively inexpensive Chinese brands replacing traditional manufacturers. Thanks to places like Norway and China, a lot of arguments about the comparative advantages between the two technologies will soon be grounded in real-world data. Thank you, John. A unique look at a John Deere B. We're off to Oklahoma for Tractor Tales next. Hey folks, welcome back to Tractor Tales. This week, accompany me down to Oklahoma we're gonna check out a 1937 John Deere B. We got out of West Texas probably about 20 years ago and it was in pieces. And we had collected up uh, all the new old start parts to put it all back together. And uh, it is unusual uh, in the sense it's got a set of uh, dual wheel setup for lister crops. So these wheels can be spaced out about 10 inches and it'll literally ride the ridge. And you can see the front tires how they're sloped, or you can get up on the front of that ridge and it'll just kind of steer itself up on top. We use it for belt work at the show and parades and we've got a program with the schools that the school kids get to drive it. Uh, a, lot, a lot of them have never done anything like that. It's pretty neat. Of course, I like any, anything that's older that doesn't have battery operated uh, mechanism that I think it's fun to show people how, I, I was telling you like the school kids, so they walk up to that and we're going to drive it, you know, they said, well, where's the starter at? And I go, well, you got you to hand start that. We call them the unstyled tractors that you have to hand start. They get a lot more conversation, I think, with people, just kind of telling them about the way things used to be versus how 
easy it is now. You just go up, turn the starter on, and there you go, you know. Put everything together, it took about three years. The tires were pretty hard to come up with. We found the uh, Miller tire, found those for us up in Ohio, and then the front tires we tracked down up in Iowa. Like I said, it's part of the hunt. It's fun to find that stuff, and eventually get it all put together, it, it, it pays off. We've, we've had a lot of fun with it and get a lot of compliments about it. A year ago, corn prices were nearing $8. Today, prices continue to slide. So is a major commodity reset underway? That's our Farm Journal Report next. U.S. Farm Report is produced and distributed by Farm Journal Broadcast. Welcome back to U.S. Farm Report. Trusted, timely, tradition. Grain prices have seen a big pullback recently, leaving many farmers to wonder if this is a new plateau in the market. Michelle Rook joins us to look at what's behind the correction and if it's a short or long term trend. Michelle? The rally in the grain markets the last two years has been fueled by many factors, including production issues around the globe, the Black Sea War, and global economic concerns tied to inflation. So is this a major commodity reset or just a pullback in an otherwise bigger commodity super cycle? I talked to market experts to find out. Grain prices hit some historical highs in 2022 and old crop stocks remain tight in the U.S. and globally. But the market is now transitioning to new crop with USDA estimating bigger supplies of soybeans and especially corn. If we have a really big crop this year, there's no doubt um, our carryover could go from 1.3 billion to 2.3 billion. I mean, that's possible. Prices are going to go lower. The funds, uh, I think, have a mentality going back to this uh, most recent USDA crop report that carryouts building, we're going to hit 181 and a half bushel national average yield in corn and 52 on beans. Uh, we're transitioning to El Nino, and that means we're going to have perfect weather. Currently, old crop prices for corn and beans are still higher than new crop, but for how long? Break in the inverse, if you have it, is likely not happen till late this summer. So last half August, first half September, particularly as the September uh, contract goes off the board. Uh, but it could be, you know, it, it's potentially earlier if the crop continues to develop well. So that could mean some volatile prices yet this summer. Besides higher production, the other change moving into the 23 crop season is the funds have moved out of commodities. Now with a fiscal policy that says we're going to create an environment where we can deflate values, they are selling. So yes, I think that the funds are going to move into other investments. I think it's going to going to take quite a story to attract them back into agriculture right now. So does the reset in grain prices mean the bull market is over? Some analysts say this is just part of the typical super cycle pattern. If you study all major bull markets and commodities in agriculture, they typically follow a 12 year cycle from start to finish. You initially get a two year rally up, which we did from 2020 mid year to 2022 kind of mid year. And then you typically have a year and a half correction, demand destruction, some supply improves. So he says the current commodity reset is just the first wave of a longer bull market. We believe we're nearing the end of a first reset in a super cycle 12 year bull market in commodities. This is the time that everyone believes that the last two years was a flash in the pan, that it was that it was never, you know, it's not going to continue. It's all over, and it really isn't. The, the, the problems that exist with supply and demand that created the rally to begin with haven't gone away. However, it may not be the same type of reset we had in the past, most recently 2013, in part because of global export competition, especially from Brazil, which is aligning with China and has taken over as the top exporter of corn and soybeans. We've gone from, what, 105 to 110 million ton to 150 million ton crop. I mean, the, the numbers are staggering. However, Nicholson says some of that export loss will be offset by stronger domestic demand with the growing population and the push to green fuels. When we look at our 10-year baseline being very strong in the U.S., we think about a strong livestock market and strong demand for livestock products. Also, you see, particularly on the oilseed side, you see strong demand for crushed crush soybeans. 
For soybeans, Nicholson estimates another 600 million bushels of crush capacity, which should keep prices supported long term. When we look at a 75 percent probability on beans, you know, we've got, you know, kind of the bottom end as you get out to the end of that, this 10 year baseline, you're still above kind of around the low end is around $14 for the national average farm gate price. And corn will have to fight for acres, which will keep prices higher than historical averages and in the middle of trading ranges established in the mid 2000s. Are we going back to $3 corn? No. Are we going back to low $4 corn? In our minds, no. We do see um, those prices staying good for the farmers in this range that we established back in the mid 2000s. We're not going to move out of that range at this point. We just may not be we may not be trading at the top end of that range. We may be trading more in the middle of that range. Surprisingly, he says wheat has been the leader with global stocks at the tightest levels since 2007 08. You know, you're going back multiple year lows here and, and wheat stocks to use ratio has been coming down over a multi year period, too. So look for a lot of volatility in wheat. And so wheat may also have to compete for acres with price. That will put acres away from soybeans and corn both. Uh, so, you know, corn and soybeans have to maintain or try to keep their acres as well. So again, the acreage uh, fight, if you have it, will be will still remain in place. The one difference in concern is that input prices are much higher than commodity resets in the past, which could eat into profits. I'm Michelle Rook reporting for U.S. Farm Report. Thanks, Michelle. Well, do this week's analysts agree? And how can farmers adjust? Arlen Suderman and Tommy Grisafi rejoin me next. Welcome back to U.S. Farm Report. Well, before we answer the question, is a great commodity reset now underway? We did have the grain deal this week. Some nervousness. Are we going to see Ukraine and, and, and Russia come in with an agreement? But we're kicking the can down the road two months. So what do some of these wheat producers that are looking at harvest coming up, what do they need to be thinking about, Arlen? Uh, it's risk management, uh, this, uh, once again, because uh, the downside price risk. And is the hard red winter wheat crop short? Absolutely it is. And it's shorter than what the USDA indicated. It's shorter than what the trade said. If you look at the six analog years for crop condition ratings, five of those six years saw the hard red winter wheat crop get smaller ahead of the final report on September 30th. But U.S. hard red winter wheat price was overpriced. It had already overpriced that in. We have milling wheat from Europe coming into the United States, and it pencils out right into the interior of the United States. And so that has a big psychological impact on the market. It's been going on for 90 days, but it, Bloomberg finally picked up the story and kind of woke up the market to the reality. And that pulled the legs out of from underneath the only real bull story we had in the grain and oilseed complex right now. Can we get rallies? Absolutely, because this now emphasizes to the world market that it matters whether it rains in Argentina so they can get their winter wheat crop planted and get enough acreage planted. It matters whether El Nino cuts the size of the Australian crop. It matters whether it stays dry now in Kazakhstan's spring wheat belt and in Russia's spring wheat belt, in Canada's spring wheat belt. All those things matter a whole lot more now. So it's possible, not necessarily will happen, but possible that we could see a rally based on one of those factors. But as you look at prices today and you look at where we were a year ago compared to where we are now, not just in wheat, but also corn and soybeans. And you look at some of these outside markets and other commodity markets as well. Tommy, is a commodity market reset underway? Well, that's a great question. And the Federal Reserve gave the warning to all investors, all traders around the world. The Fed said, we are going to combat inflation. And the way they do that is by raising interest rates. Now, the Fed funds rate, which you can see at the Chicago Board of Trade, if you Google Fed funds, the Fed funds rate's now five and a quarter. And real inflation, they say, still at five, which isn't good, but this administration's going to do a victory lap, and they want to squash inflation. There's also a chance, and we haven't talked about it yet, but they may raise rates another quarter and another quarter. The Fed has signaled they want commodity prices to come down. We have an election next year. There's no doubt in my mind this administration or any administration wants to run around and say that they got energy prices calmed down and they got food prices calmed down. And they did that for you, the American, the, all the Americans. Now, 99% of America is not a farmer. And so that's a heck of a thing to say during election year. 
Arlen, what do you think to that question? Do you agree with Tommy? I mean, is a commodity market re or commodity reset, is that now underway? Yeah, I think it's been basically under the way since June 19th of last year when we pivoted and we've been seeing money generally flow out as a result ever since then out of the markets. And we see a strong correlation between these inflation expectations and money flowing in or out of the general commodity space, as well as the grain specifically. Well, talking about that then, Tommy, real quick, how do farmers need to readjust their mindset as they head into, you know, not just this year, but looking at next year and even the next year? Sure, I have those prices here. I wish I had my bifocals on, but I'll read to you this. December 26 corns 460 and November 26 beans are 1070. Now they don't trade actively, but to Arlen's point, and he nailed it, there's a lot of things going on. Could we have a short covering rally? Absolutely, be ready for it. Have a plan, put the orders in at the elevator and don't be afraid to commit to those prices. But long-term, two years, three years, four years, the Chicago Board of Trade has the prices gently going lower. And what's happened? And to everything, I agree with what Arlen said. Your cost production is going to stay high for a while. There's a lot of things that go into growing a crop. And as you all know, it hasn't been easy to get labor. And everything's so doggone expensive. Yeah. Tommy, Arlen, thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate it. All right. We need to take a break. And then we have much more this weekend right here on U.S. Farm Report. Outdoors on the Farm is brought to you by Land Trust. Join our community of thousands of outdoor enthusiasts. Find properties, connect with landowners, and book an experience today. Learn more at LandTrust.com. We've talked about cover crops as the possibility of the next cash crop on your land, but what about finding a new revenue stream through renting out your ground for hunts? It's a concept growing in popularity even in the Midwest. AgriTalk host Chip Flory gives us a unique look as he visits Andrew McRae's farm in Missouri this weekend for Outdoors on the Farm. Andrew, when we talked earlier, we talked about what land trust provides for the landowner in this whole operation. But what do you really get out of it? Land trust helps you build a relationship with folks that want to come out and experience the land, hunt, or whatever they may want to do. And that would be really hard for me to do otherwise. Yeah, and Nick, You've you've talked a couple of times about uh, how it's not the big one year commitment. Yeah, I think that's I think on both sides, you know, on our side, it's a lot more um, affordable. You know, I couldn't yeah. afford a, a year lease. And why would I do a year lease in northwest Missouri? I don't live here. Right. So if I want to come experience this, you know, this country and a hunt out here or you know, fishing or whatever, it would make no sense for me to do that. The other thing that I really appreciate about what's going on is what you do, Colton. Uh, you're, you're making sure that the property is is suitable to bring a hunter in from right. 300 miles away. Totally. Yeah, our team comes out and says, hey, this is a beautiful spot. Yeah. Folks are going to have a great time out here. Yeah, there's plenty of wildlife, right? And that's, it's funny, that tends to be a side effect from working with, with great producers like Andrew, is that you've got all these awesome operations and just kind of a byproduct of that is great great wildlife habitat. We love working with producers all over the country and you hear, you know, we got to speak with Andrew's dad for quite a while and you hear the family history and, you know, hundred something years. Yeah. That's, that's pretty incredible. But then, on, of course, I am a sportsman. Yeah. And so seeing people with, you know, sons, daughters, friends, family going out to experience this, but also, hey, they got a bird or, you know, right now it's turkey season or, you know, they were successful on their hunt. But uh, that is really fun. And you read the reviews, like we're sitting, there's a pond behind us and Colton caught about 12 fish. So, you know, maybe we didn't get a bird this morning, but you come back and you fish. There's one guy that has caught fish. <laughs> Andy. Yeah. What do you make of all of this? I, I just think, it, you know, I could be in, uh, could be in my basement on a Zoom call right now, Chip. Yeah. But we formed this partnership with, uh, with Land Trust, uh, what, Nick, six, eight months ago? Yeah, I think right in the summer. And uh, this has really been my first time out with the Land Trust people, and I, you know, buddies for life. This has been, yeah. you know, to get to know them in an environment like this is just incredible. Then we had just pulled up. Oh, we were maybe a half a mile away, something like that. And I was trying to listen, see if I could hear anything goblin down here. And all of a sudden, I hear a couple of shots, and I'm thinking, man, oh, man, we're on them. 
I don't know if you missed I, him. I, 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 I buckled him a little bit, but the second one was high, I know, and he took off like a bat out of you know what. <laughs> All right, we sure hope that you guys have enjoyed the time that we're spending outdoors on the farm. Thanks, Chip. Well, when we come back, Colorado passed a law, but what does right to repair really mean? That's customer support this weekend. Next. How big a problem is right to repair? Last month, Colorado became the first state to pass a right to repair bill for farmers. But what does right to repair really mean? Here's John Phipps. Right to repair remains a problem for some farmers. What is your take on the memo that the American Farm Bureau Federation and John Deere announced that farmers now have the right to repair their own equipment, but with a few caveats? Will this fix the right to repair issue, or is it just a way to produce another revenue stream for John Deere? And that's from David Marshall. And Dave, I need your address for your mug. This controversy gets far more coverage than it needs or deserves for these reasons. The catchy title for this debate is inaccurate. We fix our machinery, a lot, a lot of it, all the time. R2R, as it is abbreviated, often should be labeled right to hack, or override intellectual property law, or evade pollution regulations. My guess is it involves relatively few farmers, many, perhaps a large majority, are less concerned. Headlines are virtually always about John Deere. I think that is partly due to the intense brand loyalty of their customers. Despite frustrations, it seems few farmers driving green contemplate switching brands. John Deere executives must have a hard time taking R2R seriously when they're looking at sales numbers like this. R2R is theater, not economics. Machines are more reliable than ever before. When they do fail, having the manuals and computers that service techs use would not encourage me to attempt some jobs. We've made some starts on some repairs and wisely realized our incompetence levels. Dealer service is expensive, but self-repair isn't exactly free. Compare it to the cost of doing complex repairs yourself. After re-repairing re a few times because of reassembly mistakes or damage to adjacent components, many of us limit ourselves to repairing what we're comfortable tackling. Time matters. Mid-harvest is not the time to master a difficult repair. There is a cost to having trained techs available locally and a trusted service department. That cost should be expected and borne as possible to keep it available. Given what we have learned about electronic connectivity, I think farmers should think twice about putting foreign electronics or programming in their machines. If deer can lock up combines in Ukraine, why couldn't the reverse happen here? Summing up, R2R is overrated, politically tainted, and violates a guiding principle first learned by humans 15,000 years ago. Don't hassle your tool makers. Thanks, John. And remember, you can send your questions or your comments to John. You can do that at mailbag at usfarmreport.com. Well, a strong start to the growing season in Illinois is creating some high hopes for yields. We'll tell you what's playing in farmers' favor next. Closed captioning on U.S. Farm Report is brought to you by BASF. BASF, helping you to do the biggest job on earth. USDA's big crop report last week made some big assumptions about supply and demand. But when it comes to supply, USDA currently has penciled in a record yield for both corn and soybeans nationally. And ask Illinois farmers and agronomists, and they'll tell you it's a solid start. And high hopes are now sprouting for historic yields. Planting 2023 is nearing the finish line in Illinois. The weather was fit and ground was fit, so when that's ready to go, you, you better be ready to go too and put it in the ground. Uh, we finished with our corn about a week ago and then we uh, switched to beans. USDA says 84% of the corn is planted across Illinois as of last Sunday. That's 21 points ahead of average and 35 points quicker than the same time last year. And 77% of the soybean crop is already planted, 32 points above average and 43 points quicker than last year's pace. We did plant soybeans first, but I mean just a few short days later when the soil temp started rising, we 
got both planters rolling and had beans and corn going at the same time. Rob DeFau started planting soybeans toward the end of April. Typically, he wouldn't start until after Mother's Day. Everybody's trying to push the envelope a little earlier, and I guess the beans are a little more forgiving than corns. It's a trend Farm Journal agronomist Ken Ferry says is growing in popularity. Early planting of beans is something that's really kind of evolved what, over the last five years or so. We're probably definitely crashing records on the amount of beans that we were able to stick in early. Before the rain the past couple weeks, it was getting dry, with Ferry saying some farmers were holding off to plant until they had rain. But now with the majority of the soybeans seen in early planting this year, Ferry is optimistic about yield potential. That means that we're going to have even our fullest season beans are going to be able to pre solstice flower for us. So I think the potential for our soybean crop here is uh, is really looking good to have this many acres planted early. So what exactly does that mean in terms of yield? Ferry says their data is promising. In our trials, as we look at the early planting, you get more nodes, of course, uh, going before the solstice but if you can get flowering ahead of that solstice um seven to ten bushel is definitely not out of the reach it's definitely a mixed bag in other areas as we saw from the kansas wheat tour this week well that does it for us farm report this weekend thank you so much for watching be sure to tune in again next weekend as we work to build on our tradition have a great weekend everyone u.s farm report is produced and distributed by farm journal broadcast